Hello, and welcome back to Epidemiology 101 on Ahead of the Epicurve. This is the second episode of our multi-episode series, teaching you the basics of epidemiology, and then expanding into real-world um, situations and applying it to more advanced concepts. So at the beginning of today's episode, we'll just do a quick recap of last week. Um, so last week, we defined uh, what epidemiology means. Um, we, In that definition, we learned about distribution and determinants and person, place, time. We learned what the difference between public health and clinical health is, um, specifically focusing on public health, which is what epidemiology really focuses on. And we ended last week talking about what is disease, and that will segue into this week's topic of what causes disease. So if you have any remaining questions about any of the these five topics, um, go, I would say to you to go rewatch last week's video. And um, if you haven't watched last week's video at all either, I would recommend you to watch last week's video. Um, but let's get right into it. So going from what is disease to what causes disease. And so what causes disease? Agents cause disease. And an agent is just is actually just defined as anything that causes the disease in an epidemiological sense. And agents can be grouped into three general categories, biological agents, physical agents, and chemical agents. There are some more niche categories and divisions within these categories, but these are like the three general, most broad categories that encompass most agents. And so these are the ones that really we'll talk about the most, specifically biological agents, as those are really what cause most infectious diseases, which will be the ones that cause the most problems that epidemiologists would look into. So just quickly some practice. Um, I put four examples here and I want you to just quickly read them, decide is there an agent in the scenario and what the agent is and whether it be physical, chemical, or biological. So pause the video. Um, I'll pause for a little bit so you can have time to answer these questions and then restart the video when you want the answers. Okay, so the first example, Johnny hits Chris on the head with the baseball bat, giving Chris a concussion. So if you remember from our last episode, a disease is, a disease is anything where you depart from like a normal state of well-being or working. So something has changed and you're not working at your full capacity. Chris has a concussion, which by our definition falls under disease. So there is an agent in this situation. What's causing the concussion? The baseball bat. The baseball bat is your agent in this situation, and this would fall under a physical agent. Two, Chris eats food from a dented can and develops botulism. Again, botulism is a well-known disease. Um, your agent is going to be whatever causes the botulism, which is going to be the botulism bacteria, Clostridium botulinum. And that summarizes that it's a biological agent. Three, the Flint water crisis. So I'm from Michigan. Um, if anybody watching this is not from Michigan, it probably you probably still know about it because it made national headlines. But essentially, there was lead in the water in Flint, so a lot of people in Flint developed lead poisoning. So in this case, your agent would be the lead, which is a type of chemical agent. And depression. Depression is a depression's a weird one. It is a de depression is definitely a disease by our definition. It can, depending on what's causing definition, it can be biological if it's due to differences in um, it, in, ke in chemicals and hormones. It could also be physical, depending on whether you consider uh, outside circumstances to be the causes of depression. So here's some examples of some biological and physical agents. Um, the top two are physical agents. The bottom three are biological. So a mental state can be a physical agent. Physical impairment or injury is caused by a physical agent. So like if I get hit with a stick, the stick is a physical agent. Or or if I, um, if I run into a wall, that wall could be a physical agent. Chronic, genetic, and infectious diseases are often caused by biological agents. Um, genetic, your genes are counted as a biological agent, and infectious, which we'll talk about a lot today, are generally biological agents. So what are infectious agents? Your main general categories are 
five, these five viruses, bacteria, parasites, prions, and fungi. Um, you'll get to see over this video and over the next many episodes, I do not like the definition of parasites. I think it's way too broad and doesn't, it's a very poor definition because honestly, all these things are parasites by the canonical definition of a parasite. So I think it's a very poor definition, but that's how the, the, um, it's defined. So that's what we have to deal with. First, we're going to start with our discussion today with bacteria. So bacteria were, one, were probably the first forms of life to, to appear on Earth, specifically cyanobacteria. Um, there are a lot of bacterial cells, and they are very small, 40 million in a gram of soil, 1 million in, in a milliliter of water. We got a lot of them in our body as well. Bacteria are very simple organisms. They're prokaryotes, have no membrane-bound nu nucleus or any organelles, and generally they have three shapes they've got more than three shapes, um, like vib Vibrio for comma shape, but these are the three most common shapes. So they can be spherical like a ball, which is pronounced cocci or cosci or cocci, however you want to pronounce it. I like to pronounce it cocci. Ross shaped bacilli and spiral spirochete. And then also depending on how they're arranged, they can be arranged in chains, which would be strepto and then whatever the shape is, or in clusters, staph low, and then whatever the shape is. So a cluster of spherical shaped bacteria will be staphylococcus. A chain of bacilla of bacilli bacteria will be streptobacillus. That's how that works. So here are some three three pictures of um, of bacteria. Take a moment to try to remember which shape each of these is. Um, don't worry about like strepto or staphylo or anything like that. Just focus on like the shape of the individual bacteria. So I'll give you five seconds to pause the video. And when you're ready for the answer, click play. So the image in the upper left-hand corner is an image of coccus, spherical bacteria. Um, if you want a more specific definition, that is streptococcus, except for that little two-part bacteria. That's something called diplococcus because there's only two of them. On the right, that's... Um, a comma-shaped bacteria that's called Vibrio. Um, specifically, that bacteria, that's the bacteria that causes cholera, Vibrio cholera. Um, if you research that disease in the 1854 Soho cholera outbreak after last week's episode, um, good for you. Um, I find it very interesting. And in the bottom left is spirochete, spiral-shaped bacteria. So a common disease that's caused by spirochete bacteria is Lyme disease. So how do bacteria cause disease? So bacteria, just some interesting information about bacteria, some basic information. They divide by binary fission, which is almost like a simplified version of mitosis. They just divide everything that's in their cells, pitch in, and you have two identical daughter cells. Um, they don't need a host to, to replicate, which will become very key when we get into talking about other agents, specifically viruses, that's one of their key traits that they need a host to replicate. Um, and the main way that bacteria cause disease is through releasing toxins. There are two general types of toxins, bacteria release endo and exotoxins. Endotoxins are from gram-negative bacteria and are released only when the cell dies. Exotoxins are released from all bacteria and they are locally act acting toxins that are secreted by living bacteria, both gram-negative and gram-positive, and we will talk about what gram-negative and gram-positive is very shortly. So how do you prevent and control bacteria? Washing hands and decontaminating food and water is a very good way to control them. So I always like to remember the, the kind of like saying, cook, clean, chill, separate. It's a very good way to prevent bacteria from spreading by food. Um, bacteria also spend your hands, wash your hands. Washing your hands will prevent almost anything or reduce the chances of you getting almost anything except for prions. Prions are nasty little buggers. We'll talk about them as well. Um, antibiotics are a good way to, um, once you've been infected, to control bacteria. Um, but you need to be very careful about using antibiotics because of antibiotic resistance. Currently, too many people in society overuse antibiotics and don't use them properly. Um... <laughs> In our, an interesting bit of information, in our food system, meat 
is so often treated with antibiotics, like they're just thrown into the food that animals eat to prevent infection so that the animals don't die, so that the farmers or the big corporations don't lose profit. And they're dosed with so many um, low dosage antibiotics is that we, when we eat meat, we're actually eating all those antibiotics. And that's one of the big reasons that antibiotic resistant, um, antibiotic resistant bacteria are becoming so prevalent because we keep eating these low dosage antibiotics that aren't strong enough to kill those bacteria, but provide a means for them to develop resistance. Additionally, with antibiotics, when you don't take the full course of antibiotics, you can often Oftentimes, bacteria that it was supposed to kill will survive. That's why you have to take it for more than just one day. They'll survive that, that round of antibiotics. And if you don't finish the course, that, that bacteria that survived will can develop resistance and then reproduce. And now you've got um, antibiotic-resistant bacteria. So some common antibiotic-resistant bacteria are MRSA, so methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Tuberculosis has a host of uh, antibiotics that's resistant to. And it's very dangerous because antibiotics were this world-renowned invention that stopped millions of people from dying, and they're losing their impact. And we, if it keeps going this way, bacteria well, bacteria could end up something like viruses, where we don't have much in the way to stop them once you get infected. So how do we identify different bacteria? So obviously non all bacteria are the same and they can be divided into two general categories based on their cell wall composition, specifically based on whether they have an extra layers of peptidoglycan or an extra membrane. So, so bacteria that have an extra layer of peptidoglycan are called gram positive bacteria. And peptidoglycan is this is a sugar that's in the cell wall. Gram negative bacteria have less peptidoglycan and the extra membrane. So if I can have you look at the diagram in the upper right-hand corner of this slide, you'll see how the gram-negative bacteria has an outer membrane and a cytoplasmic membrane, while the gram-positive bacteria only has the cytoplasmic membrane. So how do we determine if a bacteria is gram-positive or gram-negative? And that is where gram staining comes into play. So gram staining, which is where you place pink and both pink and purple dye one after another, you put pink, purple first, wash it off, then pink, and then wash that off on bacteria. And they will stain either pink or purple. If it stains pink, that signifies that the bacteria is gram positive. And if it stains, per no, sorry, if it stains purple, it signifies the bacteria is gram positive. And if it stains pink, it signifies that the bacteria is gram negative. And this is important because, as we saw before, gram negative, gram positive bacteria act very differently. For example, endotoxins are only released by gram-negative bacteria. And additionally, a lot of antibiotics target that peptidoglycan layer, and so they will be much more effective against gram-positive bacteria. So it can be very crucial in treatment and controlling symptoms in people infected with bacteria. Now into viruses. These are very interesting. The viruses are my favorite group of organisms, or not even organisms. I don't think they're considered organisms. Favorite group, favorite group of agents to study. So what is a virus? A virus is a microscopic infectious agent that replicates only inside the living cells of another organism. That's a key point of debate because some people consider viruses living, some people don't. I personally don't consider them living because they do not have the ability to survive outside of their host. A virus is essentially just genetic material wrapped inside a layer of protein. So it has a genetic material, DNA or RNA. Oftentimes it's RNA. You do get some DNA viruses, but most of them are RNA. Um, they have a protein coat called the capsid, which protects that genetic material, so all viruses have a capsid. And then some viruses have an, uh, another layer called an envelope that surrounds the protein coat. So how does, a vi how does virus cause disease? So viruses can spread vertically from mother to child or horizontally from person to person. Most commonly, it's person to person. An example of a horizontally spread virus is HIV, where the mother, a mother could have it in the child could also be infected with HIV before birth. Um, horizontally, um, as we all know, COVID is a horizontally transmitted disease, as is um, the flu, uh, hepatitis. Hepatitis can also be transmitted vert vertically. Person-to-person um, -person transmission can occur by simple contact, exchange of saliva, um, indirect transmission, coughing, sneezing, most of them, or vector-borne transmission through mosquitoes. And we'll talk about modes of transmission, I think, next week in next week's video. And 
there should be an image off to the right. I don't know why it's not loading, but it should show the lytic cycle. And the lytic cycle is essentially the cycle where the virus attaches to a cell, injects its genetic material, which then forces this host cell to, rep to replicate copies of the virus within the cell. And then when the cell gets too many viruses inside of it, it ruptures and releases those little viruses. And that's how a virus does damage within your cells. It essentially explodes the cell by forcing the cell to be full to the brim with viruses. The lysogenic cycle is similar, except there's a latency period before it kicks into the lytic cycle. Because as we know, viruses don't act right away. Um, HIV can take years and years to really develop. So the lysogenic is kind of where the virus is sitting dormant for a while, not really doing a whole lot. The genetic material is just sitting inside the cell, and then eventually it kickstarts into the lytic cycle, and then the cell ruptures. Oh, and there's the image. So this is the lytic cycle. So some examples of the diseases caused by viruses, smallpox, the common cold is caused by rhinovirus, Ebola, AIDS, which is in a, the name for the advanced form of HIV, Yellow fever, dengue fever, hepatitis, and chicken pox. So how to prevent and control a virus. Washing hands is a good way to control some viruses. Decontaminating food and water. Um, that's a very good way. Vaccinations are especially key for viruses. They're our main way of preventing and controlling viruses. Especially since we do not have... Um, we do not have treatments for viruses at the moment. We do have things like Tamiflu, but widespread treatments for viruses don't exist. Um, that being said, if you haven't already, go get your COVID-19 vaccine. It's safe and effective, and it's how we'll end this pandemic. Um, so currently, vaccinations exist for polio, measles, mumps, rubella, and smallpox, among others. There are vaccinations for non-viral diseases, but they're not as common. Um, vaccines have been instrumental in eradicating diseases like smallpox and severe and critically reducing the incidence of other diseases like polio. Antiviral drugs, as I had said, have been developed, but they're not that common and they're not always as effective as antibiotics would be. Into my least favorite category, parasites, because I think it's so poorly defined. And so a parasite is an organism that lives inside another organism called the host and specifically lives off of the host. It harms their host, steals nutrients from the host, and basically survives at its host ex host expense. So you should be able to see the flaw in this definition is that bacteria, by this definition, are parasites. They live inside of us, or parasit or pathogenic bacteria. They live inside of us, they, harm, they would harm us, and they feed off of our nutrients while hurting us. I don't like this definition, but that's how it's defined. And an interesting bit of information, an obligate parasite is a specific type of parasite that cannot live independently of its host. But this is different from viruses in that a virus cannot replicate outside of its host. This would be, this technically would be able to, but it just won't be able to have the nutrients it needs to survive. So it's a little bit different there. So. As defined, there are three types of parasites, protozoans, which are single-celled organisms. These include your common, like, protists and, like, amoebas. Um, you have helminths, which are another name for worms, and ectoparasites, which live on top of the skin instead of within. So how does a parasite cause disease? You normally, your, normally your skin comes into contact or it enters you through somehow ingesting it through maybe, like, contaminated water, like Giardia is or contaminated food or being near pets. Um, pets are a very are a magnet for parasites, so that's why keep your pets clean. Um, mosquitoes can also transmit paras parasitic diseases. Um, a very well-known one is malaria. Malaria is caused by a, prote a protist called pr um, plasmodium, and that's transmitted by a mosquito. And parasites can also enter the body, most commonly through orifices in the skin, and can replicate inside or outside cells. So here are some examples of parasites. So Plasmodium falciparum is one of the pro uh, protists that causes malaria. There's one, there's one or two other ones. Tapeworms are a type of worm or helminth, as it's in the name, and that's it is there. That's a parasitic disease. 
And then Aglaria fowleri. This is an interesting one. This is the brain-eating amoeba. Um, it's another type of protus. Um, it's a very, very nasty disease, as you would expect a brain-eating amoeba to be. But yeah, it's another it's another interesting word. It's found in like warm water. And the water has to go really, really high up your nose. So and if you're swimming in a river, unless you get like water shot up your nose, you're not gonna have any risk of that. But that's why swimming in rivers can be dangerous, rivers and lakes. So this is a lot of redundancy, how to prevent and control a parasite. Wash cans, contam decontaminating food and water. Anti-parasitic drugs that either kill the parasite or stop it from re replicating. Bug spray, mosquito nests, flea baths to prevent the transmission. And especially treating infections in pets. That's key for parasites. The pets are magnets for these buggers. Prions. These are very interesting. These are probably the most interesting category. Not my favorite, but the, the most interesting. And the reason that they're, inter they're so interesting is because we don't know a lot about how they work. So prion is an infectious misfolded protein. There's no DNA or RNA in it. It's just a protein. It's not a living organism. And it's not a lot. there's not a lot known about them, about how they cause disease. All that's known is that there's this misfolded protein that somehow hasn't self-destructed. And it forces other proteins to mimic its misfolded shape. Now, normally when you have misfolded proteins, they're detected and destroyed, or they self-destruct, or eventually they reform their shape. Like if a protein's denatured and is misfolded, when it gets back to its normal situation, it refolds properly. For some reason, prions don't do that, and they force other proteins to take on their prionic shape, and they collect in the brain and form holes in the brain, and it cause other forms of brain damage. And prions can be spread from humans to other humans by genetics or inherited from family or can be spread by ingestion of infected meat. And that's a very common one, especially infected brain meat. The examples of prions are mad cow disease. Also, the, the scientific name for that is bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And you can see the damage that a prion does in the image kind of center bottom that what mad cow disease and the prion that causes it does to the cow brain. It just completely destroys it. All those white little holes are like holes in the brain where the like cluster of prions have turned it into sponge. And so mad cow disease in humans is called creutzfeldt jakob disease, uh, shortened to CJD. Um, Kuru is another example of prions, and I'll have an interesting story for that. Scrapey and chronic wasting disease is are other prion diseases. And Kuru is a prion disease that's native only to Papua New Guinea. I think Papua New Guinea is where they're really only, are really where the only active cases of kuru are, and kuru is actually spread in Papua New Guinea because of uh, a tribal practice of where once dead, once when people die, um, the women in Papua New Guinea eat the brains of the of the um, deceased person. If that deceased person had kuru where the incidence is fairly is very high compared to the rest of the world, they would also then develop Kuru and then die and the cycle continues. So how to prevent and control prions? Monitoring the consumption of meat products because there isn't really a lot you can do to destroy a prion. Or once it's there, you can't do a lot. So it can't be cured. Certain medicines can delay it, but it's inevitable that you will eventually develop brain damage and die. And so prions are so severe and taken so seriously that if in a cow, if one is in a herd, if one cow is found to have mad cow disease, the whole herd will have to be put down. And sometimes the whole farm is just completely cleansed. And just really having a farm, having a cow get mad cow disease is just detrimental to the farmer because it causes so much damage because like all your livestock are just have to be put down because it can be so dangerous to humans if that prion gets into the food system. And then to the final category we'll go over today, fungus, or in the plural, fungi. So fungi are eukaryotic organisms. They can be unicellular or multicellular, and they include yeast, mold, and mushrooms, and other types of fungi. So fungus are often caused by uh, surface contact with fungus. They can also be ingested with like something like ergotism. But oftentimes it's physical contact with contaminated surfaces or the spores of the fungi which spread through the air. Um, 
fungi often produce toxins or the pathogen pathogenic versions of it. That's why, like mushrooms, if like toxic mushrooms, you eat them, they create toxic um, toxins in your stomach that can kill you. And once it takes residence in the body, it can replicate like most other pathogens. So some examples of fungi are Candida albicans, which is yeast, and that causes the disease thrush. And I believe the upper right-hand image is of thrush in the throat. Uh, Aspergillus is a type of mold. Um, Trichophyton, Epidermophyton, and Microsporum all, are all causes of athlete's foot, which is scientifically it's called tinea pedis. And Clavicets purpurea ergotism, which I believe is the image in the bottom right. Ergotism is a nasty disease that essentially causes the gangrene or um, death of tissue in your limbs and just turns them black. black. And I believe it's also called St. Elmo's fire because of that. So how to prevent and control the fungus. Washing hands and having good hygiene. Antifungal medications to kill the fungus or prevent replication is also common. We do have antifungal medications. But other than that, it's a lot of the it's a lot of the same prevention and control methods, and so that will do it for today. Um, those are the five main categories of infectious agents. Um, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture and learned something. Um, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. And have a good week, and watch out for next week's episode.